Corporal Craig Fowler, Commander, U.S. Southern Command. General Van Herc is appearing for his first posture hearing in his current command, and Admiral Fowler is returning to testify as Southcom Commander, and this could be your last hearing before the committee, Admiral. Thank you for your dedicated service to the nation and the Navy. Um, we appreciate it very, very much. Uh, I want to thank both of you, uh, indeed, for your decades of service and also obviously thank your families for the sacrifices that they've uh, made to support you. And on behalf of the committee, I would also want you to thank the men and women of your commands for the selfless dedication and service to the nation. The security environment we face today is fundamentally different than even a decade ago. Near-peer competitors China and Russia have significantly narrowed the technological advantages that the U.S. military previously enjoyed, and they threaten to contest our military operations across all domains, including land, sea, air, cyberspace, and space. The 2018 National Defense Strategy shifted our defense priorities to focus foremost on strategic competition with China and Russia. But we need a, to better define what our objectives are for outcompeting our adversaries in this geopolitical rivalry. General Vern Herc, you are responsible for protecting the homeland, and over the last year, that mission has centered on the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the request of FEMA, Northcom has deployed more than 2,200 personnel as part of 25 vaccination support teams at 17 sites in nine states, administering more than 50,000 doses daily. I understand that FEMA has discussed with you ramping up to 100 vaccination support teams with the capacity to vaccinate over 400,000 people per day. This is in addition to the more than 30,000 National Guard members supporting civil authorities across 46 states and three territories. General Van Herc, I hope you will share your views on the challenges in scaling up this effort and any lessons learned regarding what we need long-term for addressing future pandemic threats to our nation's health security. NORTHCOM is also tasked with operating our Homeland Ballistic Missile Defense, the ground-based mid-course defense system, to protect the United States against an intercontinental ballistic missile attack from rogue states. The threat from North Korea has only grown in recent years, and I would be interested in hearing your assessment of what additional steps can be taken to better integrate our domain awareness and modernize our missile defense systems, including plans for the next generation interceptor and the so-called underlayer missile defense protection for the homeland. NORTHCOM is designated as the advocate for capabilities in the Arctic and plays a leading role in bringing together the combatant commands that share responsibilities for this increasingly critical region. As Russia and China become more assertive in the Arctic, it is essential that we develop a unified response across combatant commands and across the interagency, as well as in coordination with our allies and partners. General, I would appreciate any updates you could provide on this critical region. The situation along our southern border has implications for both NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM. Despite President Biden's termination of the declaration of a national emergency along the border and ending of the diversion of funds for the border wall, roughly 3,600 military personnel remain deployed in the region in support of the Customs and Border Patrol. This raises questions about what the Defense Department's role should be in a whole-of-government response to the situation at the southern border. In addition, recent weeks have seen an increase in the number of unaccompanied children arriving at the southern border, seeking to escape instability and violence in their home countries. While these children need to be cared for in a humane and safe manner on a case-by-case -case basis, I also believe we need to address the migration problem at its source, including the conditions causing adults and children to seek asylum at our border. Admiral Fowler, I would be interested in your thoughts on how the Department can use security cooperation strategically to build partner capabilities and institutional capacities to counter the drivers of instability in Central America. SOUTHCOM's traditional mission has focused on countering the scourge of narcotics and the threat from national, transnational criminal organizations. The growing influence of China and Russia, however, threatens to further destabilize the region as these geopolitical rivals take advantage of corrupt governance in the region to advance their own strategic interests. China's maligned 
financial influence and Russia's disinformation amplified on Russian-controlled Spanish-language media outlets threatened to undermine democratic governments. And in Venezuela, the Maduro regime, propped up with external support from Russia, China, and others, has caused millions of Venezuelans to flee into neighboring countries, with Colombia bearing the brunt of this exodus. Admiral Fowler, I'm interested in your assessment of the threat from near-peer competitors in the Southcom area and how we might work strategically with partners in the region to build resilience to China and Russia's malign activities. I want to thank you again for being here this morning, and I look forward to your testimony. And I also just want to note for my colleagues that there will be an informal classified briefing by Admiral Fowler in SBC 217 immediately following the session until 1230 when we must cease. And the subject will be the increasing Chinese influence in the South Com area. Um, with that, let me recognize Senator Inhofe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for um, calling this uh, important hearing. I would also thank our two witnesses, North Com and South Com. As you know, my top priority remains ensuring the effectiveness and implementation of the, the national defense strategy We've all agreed this is, a, this is our roadmap. This is what we're supposed to be doing. It's true today as it was two years ago, which identifies competition with China and Russia as uh, the, the central challenge to the United States' prosperity and security. However, the growing influence of China and Russia isn't limited to Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Most people think about that. Uh, they talk about the South China Seas and other places where there are problems. Both countries have shown their way that they view the Western Hemisphere as critical terrain for fulfilling their global ambitions and challenging the United States. Admiral Fowler, China and Russia are expanding their access and influence in your AOR through increasing arms deals, military deployments, and economic and diplomatic coercion. At the same time, much of the drugs poisoning American cities are coming from Latin America through the vast illicit networks operating by multi-billion dollar criminal organizations. General Van Herk, you have operational responsibility for defense of the United States homeland. We're facing a lot of challenges from the growing Chinese and Russian missile capabilities, including advanced cruise missiles and hypersonic missiles. And I hope you will discuss any emerging gaps you foresee in our homeland defense and they offer your uh, recommendations for addressing these, these uh, challenges. Specifically, I'm interested in your views on whether waiting another decade for a new ground-based interceptor makes any sense, or if we need to act sooner given the growing threat from our adversaries. Meanwhile, we're seeing a new crisis uh, brewing in the southwest border. According to the New York Times, approximately 78,000 immigrants tried to cross the border in January. That's double the number that were there from the, uh, the year before. So we know that's happening. We know that's increasing. We don't have the numbers yet of the, uh, <clears throat> I tried to get them this morning of February. We don't have those numbers yet, but uh, we will get them. And we see that this, this thing is getting worse. I've always said border security is the national security. And my visit to the border in August of uh, uh, 19 confirmed this belief. These new statistics are alarming, so I hope that you'll address whether NORTHCOM's border support mission is sufficient and what we can do to better ensure the, uh, our, our laws are enforced. And, you know, we, we talk around this thing. Nobody wants to talk about it. No one wants to admit it. We've got a new president now, and the new president has a different mission. You know, he's, he wants to, everyone to love him, and I understand that. But uh, you, you know, I've got a picture here. I, I want to be made part of the record. This is all these people coming across illegally wearing their Biden T-shirts. Now, this is going on, you guys. This, don't act like it's not. So anyway, we need to face this problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Inhofe. And now let me recognize Admiral Fowler for his testimony. Good morning, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, distinguished members of the committee. And thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I'm honored to be here with my friend and shipmate, General Glenn Van Herc of the United States Northern Command. Now more than ever, I feel a sense of urgency about the global threats we face here in our neighborhood, this region of our home. This neighborhood is our home. It's a shared neighborhood. 
It's a hemisphere which is of vital national interest to the United States. Two of the most significant threats we face are China and transnational criminal organizations. The Chinese Communist Party, with its insidious and corrupt influence, seeks regional and, regional and global economic dominance and its own version of a rules-based international order. Our strategic competition with China is global, not just in the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea. China is quickly growing its influence here in our hemisphere, working on over 40 port deals, dishing out significant loans for political and economic influence, pushing for IT structure, and engaging in predatory practices like illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. We have seen many of these tactics in Asia and Africa, and we can't let them prevail here in our neighborhood. Transnational criminal organizations pose a direct threat to our national security. They traffic in arms, humans, drugs, and they claim tens of thousands of lives in America every year. These murderous tactics have resulted in 43 of the 50 most violent cities in the world being here in this hemisphere. And they drive illegal migration, and they allow bad actors like China to gain influence. COVID-19 has hit this hemisphere hard. According to the IMF, the economies of Latin America and the Caribbean shrunk 7.4% in 2020. The impacts of the pandemic, like a perfect storm, will alter the hemisphere for years to come. In the midst of all this, two back-to-back -back hurricanes devastated Central America, causing even greater instability. The pandemic and these unprecedented storms struck on top of this already vicious circle of threats, creating strong push factors for people in the region seeking a better life, seeking security to come with their families to the United States. Despite an economy in tailspin, more than 5 million refugees have fled Venezuela in the illegitimate Maduro regime. Maduro continues to cling to power with the support of Cuba, Russia, Iran, and China. We can't face such daunting challenges alone. The only way to counter these influences, these threats, is to strengthen partnerships. That's how we'll win the strategic competition. I've been impressed with nations who have worked shoulder to shoulder with us despite the pandemic to counter threats. Nations like Colombia, whose professional forces have stepped up in the midst of a pandemic to conduct counter transnational criminal organizations with dozens of other nations. And nations like Brazil, who sent their of airborne company to our high-end training with the United States Army in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Good neighbors are here when, they, when you need help, and that's what the United States did in Southcom when COVID hit. We stepped up with our humanitarian assistance program, contributing over 450 projects in 28 countries. Overall, the United States is the leader in humanitarian assistance in COVID in Latin America and the Caribbean. Southcom works every day to build readiness with our trusted military and security partners. We do this through security cooperation. This includes institutional capacity building, legal training, education, IMET, and exercises. We focus on developing professional military forces that know how to fight and use the lawful use of military force. We focus on human rights training, women, peace, and security programs, and NCO development. Modest investments in these programs and intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance and our presence, our posture, go a long way in this hemisphere and will help our, fight our partners counter these global threats. Finally, our success would not be possible without the men and women of our Southcom team. We're taking proactive steps to protect them from unacceptable behaviors like sexual assault and harassment, racism and extremism. We take these threats seriously. They're a cancer to our readiness, and it's the right thing to do. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Inhofe, on behalf of the Southcom team, thank you for the trust you place in us, and I look forward to our discussion and questions today. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, General Van Herk, please. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, and the distinguished members of the committee, it's a privilege to testify with you here today. I'm honored to serve as the Commander of the United States Northern Command and North American Aerospace Defense Command, and I'm grateful to appear alongside Admiral Fowler 
as SOUTHCOM is a crucial partner in Homeland Defense. U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are separate commands charged with the critical mission of defending the United States and North America, respectively. U.S. NORTHCOM is the U.S. Geographic Combatant Command responsible for the defense of the, <clears throat> excuse me, Homeland Defense of Civil Authorities, uh, Defense Support of Civil Authorities, and Theater Security Cooperation for Canada, the Bahamas, and Mexico. NORAD is the binational command that provides aerospace warning, airspace control, and maritime warning for the United States and Canada. U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD service members and civilians are executing the Secretary of Defense's top priority by standing watch to defend our nation against all threats, whether posed by competitors, natural disasters, or a pandemic. Over the last year, NORAD fighters, tankers, and airborne early warning aircraft responded to multiple incursions into our air de defense identification zones. Multiple ships sortied under U.S. NORTHCOM operational control to defend our maritime approaches, and U.S. NORTHCOM synchronized the Department of Defense's support to lead federal agencies as thousands of service members deployed within the U.S. NORTHCOM area of responsibility to aid states and local communities in the fight against coronavirus. Today, thousands of service members are providing life-saving vaccinations to our citizens. No matter the threat, we are always ready to defend the lives of our citizens and our homelands. Right now, as we confront the scourge of this pandemic, the threats we face and the pace of change in the geostrategic environment continue to advance. We have entered an era of renewed global competition, and this time we're facing two peer competitors, both nuclear armed. We must adapt to the challenges posed by this reality. Since the first Gulf War, the United States military has focused on projecting power forward to confront rogue regimes, violent extremist organizations, and other potential adversaries who threatened American interest. We trusted in our nuclear deterrent and an assured power projection capability, as well as the blessings of geography to prevent an attack on our soil. In parallel, our competitors expanded the definition of competition into economic and informational areas and have aggressively advanced their own military capabilities to hold our homelands at risk, both kinetically and non-kinetically. Those efforts were predominantly focused on long-range strike, improved delivery platforms, cyber capabilities intended to circumvent our defenses from all directions and in all domains and exploiting a perceived gap between our foundational nuclear deterrent and our conventional homeland defense deterrent capabilities. Concurrently, the rise of transnational criminal organizations and the subsequent strains on governance and the instability they create has created additional opportunities for our competitors that they are working to exploit today. We must outpace our competitors by accelerating our own efforts to transform our culture, investing in our people to grow both talent within the ranks and counter extremist and destructive behaviors, anti-ethical to our values. We must invest early and often in relationships with allies and partners to develop a global team of like-minded nations. And we must factor homeland defense into every strategy, plan, force management, force design, as well as all aspects of acquisitions and budget so we can deter in competition, de-escalate in crisis, and defeat in conflict. To do this, both U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are concentrated efforts on building our capability to deter and, if needed, defense against increasingly advanced all-domain threats. Together with the Canadian Armed Forces, we are in the early stages of NORAD modernization and building additional military capabilities in the Arctic. In coordination with the Missile Defense Agency, United States Strategic Command, United States SpaceCom, we're maintaining and improving our ballistic missile defense capability. In order to balance our readiness for crisis and conflict while also staying in global competition, we're placing significant emphasis on left of launch framework. This framework will increase decision space, uncovering more deterrence and de-escalation options vice in-game defeat. We're advocating for investment in all domain awareness to generate a layered sensing grid and a layered defense approach that emphasizes the use of an open sensor data architecture and machine enhanced processing in order to achieve information dominance and decision superiority. Through information dominance, we will grant decision makers increased decision space and build flexible response options to deter, deny, and defeat every threat to the United States and Canada. I'm grateful for the trust that you place in United States Northern Command and NORAD, and both commands take solemn pride in our responsibility to defend our homelands. We will forever have the watch 
Thank you for your support and time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you very much, General. And before we begin, I want to remind my colleagues of the procedures. Since it is impossible to know exactly when our colleagues who will be joining via the computer arrive, we will not be following a standard early bird timing rule. Instead, we will handle the order of questions by seniority, alternating sides until we have gone through everyone. Once we reach the end, if there is anyone we missed, we will start back at the top of the list and continue until everyone has had their turn. We will do the standard five-minute rounds, and I ask my colleagues on the computers and at their desks to keep, please keep an eye on the clock, uh, which you should see on your screens or right before you. Finally, to allow for everyone to be heard, whether in the room or on the computer, I ask all colleagues to please mute your microphone when not speaking. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Fowler, again, thank you for your distinguished service over many years. And uh, the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador is a particular unstable region. And many of those who are seeking uh, relief and moving towards our border are coming from this area. Uh, security and human rights have deteriorated there significantly. Increased violence by criminal organizations and narcotics distributors, uh, and we can continue to provide security clearance to these countries, security assistance rather, uh, yet corruption remains rampant and international efforts to build capabilities are not effective. In Hon Honduras in particular, the corruption appears to reach the highest level of the government. The criminal trial in the Southern District of New York of the Honduran president's brother unearth evidence of the Honduran president and other senior officials taking millions of dollars in bribes from drug traffickers. Honduran security forces are also documented as having engaged in gross human rights violations for years. Given all of this, uh, Admiral, do, do we need to reconsider whether our approach to security assistance in the Northern Triangle countries is achieving our national objectives? The perfect storm of uh, conditions that you outlined, Senator, the violence, the impact of the pandemic, uh, the impact of the hurricanes has created untenable security uh, for the citizens, and that's why we're seeing this uh, flood of migrants uh, to our borders. Our focus at Southcom um, should and, sh and remains in support of U.S. government hold efforts, our diplomats in our embassies, and that security cooperation is a long-term investment on the professional militaries. So institution capacity building, we have a long-standing human rights training program that has been effective in developing forces that know how to use uh, forces in a force in a professional manner. Our women's peace and security program has, has proven to be a game changer. There's, those nations want to model and emulate our success. Our NCO development, our IMET, there is an appropriate place moving forward, Senator, for our long-term engagement with our partners. Uh, they, they model their professionalism after us, and I, I can trust elements of the Honduran and Guatemalan forces. We vet them. We work with our interagency. It, it seems that in those areas and other areas around the world, we've invested a great deal in the military, and we've developed effective military forces, but so much of this is a law enforcement issue and a judicial issue, and we don't seem, and again, this is outside your lane, but a whole government approach would seem to me to be more of an investment in training police, in providing judicial remedies that are actual, not fictitious. Is that your view also? We need more uh, help to our other agencies? One of the successes I've seen is watching our other agencies actually engage in judicial uh, training programs and, and moving that forward. One of our own programs is the, uh, is the Defense Legal uh, Security Cooperation Program, the DILS program out of Newport, Rhode Island, where we work with partners on how they can develop an effective judicial system. I think these programs are effective, Senator. It takes time to see the results of those of that effectiveness. But in the past year, when there was a lot of opportunity for our partner militaries uh, to commit human rights violations because they were deeply involved in helping with internal security, uh, they stayed on the field in a professional manner. And they, they did model their professional behavior after the training that we've been able to provide. Thank you. 
Uh, General Vern Herrick, I'm sorry, I have but a, a few minutes, but could you give us quickly sort of your uh, takeaways from the COVID virus uh, situation? What fundamental changes we might have to make? Chairman, absolutely. Uh, COVID has great, given us great opportunity to reflect and learn on our planning as we were uh, ready. Uh, what we've ad done is continue to adapt. What we have found is that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the support functions, the emergency support function process through the interagency is crucial, working with local and state authorities to ensure that we're synced up to provide that response. We work closely with DHS. We work closely with uh, HHS, uh, public health services, to, to ensure we're ready. In addition to that, we're going back and uh, changing and updating our global pandemic and infectious disease plan to ensure that we're uh, ready and have adapted the lessons learned, uh, Chairman. Well, thank you very much, General. Thank you both for your service. Uh, Senator Inhofe, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the there's a crisis on the border. I think we all know that. It's a, the number of migrants trying to cross more than doubled in January 2021 from a year prior to that. And the number of migrant children has in custody has tripled. Now we've come a full circle. We don't like to talk about it. We had weak enforcement of our immigration laws under the President Obama, did strong enforcement under President Trump. And now the expectation of a weak enforcement under President Biden is driving a surge of illegal migrants. And that's where I have this picture here. This is their they're all coming across the border. You know, they're, they're coming fast, and they're all wearing Biden T-shirts. So let's, it, we got a problem down there. And I, I just have to ask uh, the, the question, Admiral Fowler, do you agree that a strong enforcement of the immigration laws serves as a deterrent against illegal migration? Senator, all nations deserve secure borders, and uh, our focus has been on that heinous insecurity uh, in uh, Central America caused by transnational criminal organizations that have no respect for the rule of law, uh, rain violence on their population. They, they market in drugs and people and guns and illegal mining. And uh, one of the prime sources of that underwrites their efforts is Chinese money laundering. So our focus has been on the source, uh, working with our oh, okay, partner Okay, but, but just a specific question do you agree that strong enforcement of immigration laws serves as a deterrent against illegal migration? The number one deterrent that I hear of uh, when I speak to uh, all our partner nations is the United States judicial system. So I agree, Senator. Okay, and do you agree with that also, General? Simple question. Chair Ch Chairman, um, as previously stated, border security is national security. And I agree that we must uh, uh, consider our laws that are in place. What we're doing right now is we are supporting the lead federal agency from NORTHCOM, uh, which is Homeland Security, that allows them to enforce the laws that are in book. We're providing support uh, in the form of uh, aviation support, ground support through detection and monitoring as well. Okay, but you do agree then? I Strong do, enforcement of those laws. You can have all the laws on the books you want, but if you don't enforce the laws, it's not going to work. You agree with that? I, I do okay. agree with that. Very good. And Admiral Fowler, do you? Uh, it, it, I, I'm a little concerned about something that, uh, in terms of resources down there. In your opening statement, I think or it was in the written statement. I guess it was. You said that you only receive less than one percent of all DoD ISR. Only one percent of all. DOD ISR, is that right? Senator Intelligence uh, drives everything. That allows us to have uh, the domain awareness uh, that uh, General Van Herc spoke about so we can then inform our other interagency partners of yeah. what the threats are up to. And we do, we have less than 1% of the uh, ISR. You know, at, since you, I read that some time ago and we had a visit, I, I tried to figure out how that could be. Uh, maybe I'm missing something here. That less than 1% of ISR comes into that area. And I, I don't understand. So it, that's not adequate, right? Senator, we're short in um, ISR, in intelligent assets, um, and uh, security cooperation. And we have, in general, our posture is uh, is thin. And we've got to be on the field to compete, Senator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. 
you know, I know the border. I was a, back when, back in the days I was enjoying life. I can remember <laughs> I was a builder and developer down there. People in the East Coast don't understand this, but there's an island down there called South Padre Island. It's actually, uh, now don't, don't leave because you need to hear this. Uh, <laughs> that it's, uh, that island down there is 140 miles long and one block wide. And I was a builder and developer down there. I know the border and I know I'm down there. And they talk about the tough border security and what is necessary. So I just, I just want you to know I'm familiar with that down there. And I, I think it's doing a disservice not to talk about it. We need to enforce the border. And I do want to have this picture made a part of the record at this, at this point. So with that, I'll yield the floor. Senator Shaheen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both of you for your service and for being here this morning. Admiral Fowler, I want to start with you because I find the maps that you've given us and the statistics on these alarming, to say the least. On the, the map that shows Chinese influence, if you were going to give us a map that said United States influence, how many, for example, countries could we cite that are hosting American infrastructure projects? And how many countries are enjoying training and military support or other economic support from the United States? And how many heads of state meetings could we cite since 2015? Senator, our influence is eroding. And that, that margin is shrinking. And you would be, we'd be best able to show that with arrows that have downward trends. And it's important that we remain engaged in this hemisphere. It's our neighborhood that proximity matters. And as you pointed out, the Chinese see that. We hosted a conference last week at Southcom with our allies, the UK, Canada, France, Netherlands, who have significant interests in ensuring a stable, secure neighborhood. And one of the, the foreign participants said that the region is, a life, is, a, is in a lifeboat, and it is sinking in the violence, and it is sinking in Chinese influence. What I hear from my partners is, uh, we hear you, Admiral Fowler. We know that the United States military is the best. We want to partner with you, but when you're drowning, you need a life ring. You're going to take the life ring from whoever throws it. Um, that, that is um, disappointing. I, I appreciate what you're saying, and... That was my reason for the question, because it's very clear that we are not keeping up in the way that we should in terms of influence and support in Latin America. Can I ask, when you talk about the, Senator Enhoff raised the 1% of resources that you have for Southcom, and one of the operations that you're responsible for is counter-narcotics operations. In New Hampshire, we have been dramatically impacted by the opioid epidemic, and obviously drugs coming in across our southern border come up Interstate 95 all the way to New Hampshire and northern New England. How much, if you were going to define what percentage of your operations are counter-narcotics, can you describe that? And can you use, if you had more resources, would you be able to address more of what's happening with the transnational criminal organizations? Senator, I'd like to start by thanking the New Hampshire National Guard, our state partner for El Salvador, a critical partner, and the National Guard across our region. That's our number one force provider. Uh, they've stayed engaged uh, despite the pandemic in a way that builds trust and, and partners and helps train them. What our real goal here is to train our partner nations to take care of their own security problems. We can't interdict our way out of the, the, the narcotics problem. We've got to get our partners in the game. And this past year, despite a pandemic, they actually increased their, their performance, their involvement, uh, up to 60% of all our disruptions. But that's still not enough. We've got to focus on the source and the destination. And one of the key areas that needs more emphasis, and we've really worked hard this past year with our partners is in countering the money supply. I talked about the importance of that, really getting to break the back of these organizations. And I would note that in that regard, the, the DEA has cited Chinese money laundering as the number one underwriter of transnational criminal organizations. So it's, it's gotta be a whole government effort. 
and we've got to work to build our partners' capacity. Well, thank you, and thank you for your nice comments about the New Hampshire National Guard. I agree, they have done, had an excellent partnership with El Salvador. General Van Herc, I only have a little bit of time left, but I wanted to ask you about the impact that you're seeing from climate change on the Arctic, which we know is um, melting. A lot of the ice there and opening up routes through the Arctic. What impact is that having on our, potential impact is that having on our national security and what do we need to do to respond? Senator, environmental change is having a significant impact as it creates opportunities and it also creates vulnerabilities. The question is, are we postured to uh, uh, seize on opportunities and to defend against potential competition and vulnerabilities? This creates access, access to resources. 25% uh, of Russia's GDP is dependent upon resources in the Arctic, and both Russia and China are trying to establish new norms and rules of behavior for international law. I understand the time is out here. I, I'd love to talk more to you about this subject. Um, I would love to hear that, and I would bet if we join the Law of the Sea Treaty, we might be able to better um, address some of the influences that China and Russia are doing. You don't need to respond to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sheen. Senator Worker, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Fowler, could you supplement um, on, on behalf of uh, Senator Shaheen and me the, the three charts that she mentioned? It, it, they say Chinese influence, Russian influence, uh, and Iranian influence. Uh, uh, can you get back on the record and just do one that says uh, U.S. influence? The U.S. remains the partner. No, I, no. Will you supplement on the record a chart? I'm asking you to do that. Yes, Senator. Okay, very good. Let me ask you then, um, Admiral, uh, about the involvement of the Coast Guard in what you do. Um, uh, I'm also on the Commerce Committee where we have oversight there, and I've grown concerned that the Coast Guard is not sufficiently resourced to conduct its own missions much less support what seems to be a growing demand for having Coast Guard units supporting DOD missions to Southcom and other AORs. Um, it, do, it, do I have correct information there? How much do you rely on the Coast Guard, not just to counter drug and illegal fishing missions, but also for theater engagement with us and our allies? The Coast Guard is a <clears throat> tremendous uh, asset for us, and they are on the field in a meaningful way. Uh, they, are, they are a top uh, priority for all our partners, building capacity and countering the threats. Despite the pandemic, the national security cutters, the fast response cutters, these are, these are well-manned, well-trained ships making a difference day in, day out, including their aircraft. I, I, we couldn't do our mission without the United States Coast Guard. They are a principal source to counter threats in this hemisphere. Do we have enough ships to meet your theater requirements? For we the do Coast not. Guard? We do not have uh, sufficient Coast Guard ships or Navy ships to meet the requirements. We, we need additional assets uh, and, and planes. Okay. Um, and General Van Herc, um, let's transition then to, to NORTHCOM. And uh, once again, I have the same interest as Senator Shaheen uh, about the Arctic. Uh, I was pleased that the previous administration released an updated strategy for the Arctic, uh, and afraid that we lag behind our peers, particularly Russia. Is that correct? And this year, the uh, Coast Guard begins construction of the first of a new class of icebreakers, the Polar Security Clutter, uh, Cutter. Six um, total ships have been authorized, a vast improvement over the two aging ships we have but a far cry from Russia's fleet of 40. Can you explain why icebreaking capability is so critical, and do you believe it's important to advocate for a larger uh, fleet of uh, Coast Guard cutters and icebreakers? Senator, yes, thank you, and I agree with your assessment. We are lagging behind. Why it's so important uh, is you have to be on the field to play. It's about persistence. Uh, not only do we need to have access through persistence to break ice uh, to ensure that we can have Coast Guard cutters or potentially Navy destroyers or cruisers in the area, uh, we have to have communications as well for persistence. I'm thankful to the committee for $46 million that got us started with polar communications. 
north of 65 latitude, it's really tough to uh, communicate. That'll get us an initial start. But I also have a require for fuel north of Dutch Harbor, Alaska, which will also contribute to the persistence of competing in the Arctic. Uh, this is about persistence. We're in competition, as I said in my opening statement, and to be uh, competitive with uh, Russia and China, specifically in the Arctic, you have to be part of the, uh, uh, on the field, if you will. And so it's crucial that we do that and continue uh, producing capabilities that will allow us to be in the Arctic. So fuel capabilities and communica uh, communications capabilities are not where uh, they ought to be. Uh, last year, the Navy was investigating the policy, uh, the possibility of establishing a new base in the Arctic. Uh, have you been involved in any discussions with the Navy regarding establishing a permanent base in the Arctic? And how could a Navy base improve your ability to execute U.S. Arctic strategy? Uh, Senator, to answer your question directly, I have not been involved in any discussions with the Navy. I'm aware of the study that was done for a potential port, specifically with regards to Nome, Alaska, which will get after the requirement for fuel north of Dutch Harbor. That report was completed by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and submitted for uh, congressional uh, awareness. Would this be helpful? Yes. Are you, do you have an opinion? It would be helpful to meet my requirement to have fuel for that persistence to compete with uh, nations that are interested in the Arctic. Thank you, Senator Worker. Now via WebEx, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Fowler, as you noted in your written testimony, Russia has eagerly flooded online communities in Latin America with disinformation intended to undermine faith in democratic institutions and in the United States. Separately, China is investing heavily in information technology that can be easily manipulated by the Chinese government, their discretion for espionage or cyber intrusions. Do you feel that Southcom is adequately equipped to do its part to handle the separate but overlapping risks posed by these efforts? And recently, in a in a visit to one of our partner countries, uh, I had uh, the leader of that country lean over and said, how, how do I get rid of the Chinese information technology that was sold to uh, get after the violence in the city, but then oddly appears outside the U.S. Embassy and other places which are in the most secure parts of the city? Uh, these efforts have got to require a whole of government, whole of world approach where we offer a safe technology and safe, affordable solutions moving forward. For our part, we've uh, really participated with U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command in standing up appropriate information capabilities to counter in the information space. And I think that effort is nascent. It's having some effect, but it's very uh, small scale given the volume. The, just in Russia alone, uh, they had over 17 million uh, disinformation uh, hits last year in social media. Outside Russian language, their Spanish language social media is their biggest effort, and they increased it threefold last year, particularly trying to discredit everything the United States did to help our partners uh, recover from the pandemic. Um, Admiral, as you pointed out earlier, uh, while China's economic coercion practices are only one element of its strategy to exert influence in the region, it is certainly an important one. Is there a way for Southcom and other U.S. entities to facilitate opportunities for economic engagement, where we can highlight the benefits of working with the U.S. as opposed to the China, as opposed to China? The um, there are some great efforts that Congress has championed, the Developmental Finance Corps and others, uh, in in support of that. I think it's incumbent on all professionals like myself to learn as much about the economic elements as power as possible. But then to focus on what we do best, which is working with our partner militaries, supplying them professional training, professional education, and exercise program. They want to partner with us. That's their North Star. And we've got to have the, the right security conditions so that we can have sustainable economics. Uh, businesses are fearful when they can't invest in a safe environment. Understood. General Van Herk, um, as the Admiral noted, it's clear that one of our biggest challenges in the Western Hemisphere will be China's technological engagement that threatens our security. 
Are we beginning to see any signs that China's growing technological presence in the in Southcom region is forcing Northcom to rethink its strategy of how it defends its domain, given the close proximity between the two regions? Senator, we look closely at uh, China's influence. They are absolutely in the Northcom AOR uh, attempting to influence in the Bahamas. Uh, working mm -hmm. through uh, 5G, for example, uh, the same thing uh, in Mexico. Uh, we continue to defend all domains. Uh, Northcom defends our critical cyber infrastructure with uh, allocated cyber protection teams, uh, and we work closely with uh, Cybercom and uh, NSA as well. We're the disk uh, synchronizer for uh, cyber. If there is a need to provide defense support of civil authorities, we continually work with civil authorities as well to assess the needs for homeland security, uh, as well as uh, other agencies across the government. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, in your written statement, you indicated Russia and China had developed hypersonic and nuclear warhead tipped cruise missiles. North Korea is also advancing its intercontinental ballistic missile program. These weapons put our allies and our own national security at risk. The current missile defense is based at the ground-based in inter interceptor or GBI, which was fielded 16 years ago. Since that time, we've improved the system and grown the size of the available arsenal. Last year, we appropriated money for the ne next generation interceptor, the NGI system, to improve our defenses. While I'm clear-eyed about the threat posed by enemy states missiles, it is currently a time of competing priorities, particularly in light of COVID. In your opinion, can we still rely on the GBI for the foreseeable future? And two, assuming we need to push back on the NGI system, how long can we rely on the current arsenal? Senator, I'm comfortable with my ability to defend the homeland, including uh, Hawaii, against a limited uh, state actor such as DPRK, which the system's designed for, uh, for the foreseeable future. The key thing is to maintain uh, the timeline uh, of no later than 2028 for NGI uh, to ensure that we maintain capacity and capability to defend against the ballistic missile threat. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Now via WebEx, Senator Fisher, please. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Van Herc, I appreciated our discussion last week and I'd like to revisit our conversation on the NGI, Senator Gillibrand was just uh, touching on some points of that as well. When you um, talk about the threat that we are facing and the advancing threat that we're seeing, do you believe that the additional capabilities that NGI will provide the warfighter over our current interceptor fleet are absolutely necessary? Senator, I do. Uh, it gives us extra capacity to go against um, uh, threats that are developed that could exceed our current GBI inventory. In addition to that, it will give us capability because the threat continues to advance their capabilities, such as decoys and, and diversion with the capability. So the NGI is crucial to give us that capability. It also provides us a foundation for our deterrence. It provides deterrence by denial. Uh, the nuclear deterrent is the foundation, but uh, the NGI and the GBI give us deterrence uh, uh, by denial, Senator. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, also, you and I discussed the increasingly capable cruise missile arsenals that adversaries possess and the very real threat they pose to the homeland. In your opening statement, you talk a lot about the concept of that domain awareness. Can you talk about what that means for you, how it relates to, to the threats that are posed, um, say, by cruise missiles? Senator, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, cruise missiles challenge our legacy warning system significantly. They've uh, generated uh, very long range capabilities. They can actually shoot cruise missiles, they being Russia, uh, today from over their homeland, which will challenge our legacy systems. Uh, we don't want to be in a situation, we, my personal opinion, where in-game defeat is our only option. We need to get further left, and th that starts with domain awareness. Left of the archer, if you will, uh, before they take off, whether that be in a submarine, whether that be in a sea uh, vessel, or whether that be in a, uh, a bomber, to have decision space for our senior leaders. 
a decision space starts with that domain awareness. Once you take that domain awareness, whether that be from undersea to space to cyberspace uh, and everything in between, and you use machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities, what I call information dominance, now we're able to get further left and give our decision makers uh, deterrence capabilities beyond uh, the foundation of our nuclear, which is our nuclear deterrence, and an in-game kinetic attack, which would require a response. Very escalatory in either one, Senator. You know, you're, you're using um, all sorts of technologies now that you're applying on your demonstrations um, that NORTHCOM's conducted in this area. Do you have other examples you can share with us? Absolutely, Senator. So uh, we have a program called Pathfinder that we've moved out on over the last year. Uh, that takes information, data. Uh, I'm a believer that the future of uh, competition, crisis, and conflict, he or she with the data and the information will win. What we've taken is an example. So for you, you'll you remember in 2015, uh, when the gyrocopter actually flew down from north here in the National Capital Region and landed on the Capitol lawn. Um, that that uh, situation, none of the sensors in the area, whether they be the NORAD sensors that we have or other sensors uh, alone detected that target. But when we took the Pathfinder capability and we analyzed the information, we took information that was left on the cutting room floor that was not uh, previously analyzed, there that gyrocopter was. That's what I'm talking about. Information today that exists in stovepipes and government agencies, even within the Department of Defense, that's not shared more broadly. We have to take advantage of data and information going forward, Senator. Thank, Thank you, General. Admiral. Fowler, Nebraska's RC-135s are uh, frequent guests in your part of the world, and we know that the Air Force is doing what it can, but there are shortfalls. Uh, last year, you told the committee you only have 20% of the ISR that you need, and the bulk of that amount comes from customs and border protection assets. As a commander, um, You've said that only 8% of SOUTHCOM's overall ISR need is met by military uh, assets. Is that still the case? Senator, compounding that uh, 8 percent figure, we, we received a 46 percent cut to our, our ISR-related budget last year, uh, this year, in year. So that will significantly challenge our ability to understand the threats of all types in the hemisphere. Intelligence drives everything. Yeah, yeah so, so what, what gets, gets left, left on, on the table as a result of your inability to get that ISR coverage? A significant amount of uh, movement of uh, transnational criminal organizations. Our understanding of what our uh, our competitors are up to: Russia, China, uh, Iran. Uh, a lot gets left under on the table that uh, is contributing to this violence that's driving uh, instability here in the United States and in our partner nations. And we see their presence uh, growing in your in your uh, combatant command area. So I understand the need for that. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your service and for being here today. Uh, as you know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit the Caribbean and South America very hard. Uh, I am concerned that we need to continue to stay vigilant against attempts by Russia and most especially China to exploit the suffering of our neighbors to the south to increase their influence in the region. Uh, Admiral Fowler, in, in your posture statement, you stated that China and Russia are using the COVID-19 pandemic to gain greater influence in South America. Can you explain how that is occurring, and what would you recommend the United States do to maintain American influence in the region in the face of that public health threat during that time? The uh, conditions that the pandemic has caused in Latin America and the Caribbean rival those of the Great Depression here in the United States. It will take years for the region to cover. The IMF says it will take, it is estimated as the region with the longest recovery time. Uh, we have seen, and there was a New York Times article today on this, uh, China particularly move in with a heavy-handed mask and vaccine diplomacy. 
that they are using the vaccines to lever leverage uh, deals for their IT, their 5G, and they're using it to try to drive a wedge between uh, some uh, nations like Taiwan and others in the region. Uh, this is indicative of Chinese global course of insidious uh, behavior. Uh, we're seeing it play out. We need to stay on the field with a whole government effort. And once we've taken care of uh, the United States, uh, be first with a, a concerted plan to take care of our neighborhood with vaccines here. I hear you saying that we need a much more aggressive and frankly, humanitarian effort in this part of the world, our neighboring region, in fact, part of the Western Hemisphere family, to take care of people in our own enlightened self-interest. Senator, to date, I've been very proud of the U.S. government effort in PPE and in other COVID-related supplies. We, we don't, uh, we're not taking much credit for it. But uh, by far and away, the single largest donator in this hemisphere and, and in the Department of Defense using our humanitarian assistant authorities, we moved out with small projects at, at speed, uh, over 400 projects, uh, $54 million that have made a real impact. But the, the next phase is going to be in vaccines and long-term recovery. And we've got to be as aggressive and forward-leaning in that phase, I would say particularly in this hemisphere, because the proximity here matters to the security of the United States. And it's not only a public health crisis, it's really a very deep-seated economic crisis linked to the pandemic, I hear you saying. Senator, in October, we did, I traveled with my civilian deputy commander, Ambassador Gene Maines, a wonderful diplomat, great civ mill relationship in our headquarters. We went on our first multiple day trip. We traveled to uh, Central America Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica. And the hollow look in the eyes of our, our um, partners, uh, they're struggling to fill their gas tanks and find food for their, their uh, security forces. Because of the stress the pandemic and the violence has placed, and this creates real opportunities for our competitors who are more than willing to step into that, uh, that uh, violent, uh, sauce and, and uh, take advantage of it for their own interests. And it has ramifications in terms of generating flows of migrants, the drug trade, all kinds of other ramifications that are destructive to our country, potentially. Yes, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Cotton, please. Admiral Fowler, I want to speak about the legal conditions on the ground in the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Do the governments of those three countries systematically persecute their own citizens on the basis of race, ethnicity, sex, political views, religious belief, or other such categories? Senator, when, when I go, I'm lockstep with um, our embassies, and we've got great diplomats, and uh, I, we don't see a systematic exploitation. I, I work with the militaries, and the elements we work with are vetted and trusted, and we f I find they're doing the right thing, whether Thank it's Honduras, Guatemala, or El Salvador. Thank you. I, I think that's a very important point. The governments of Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala do not persecute their own citizens systematically on the basis of race, sex, ethnicity, religion, or political views, which is the basis for asylum and refugee status under our laws. An economic migrant is not eligible for asylum. They are not eligible for refugee status. Asylum is designed for people like, say, a Hong Konger whose student visa expires and doesn't want to return to Hong Kong now that the Chinese Communist Party has cracked down on that country. The reason we have a crisis at our border is because President Biden, his administration, opened the border and ended the policies of the Trump administration that made it clear you could not make the very dangerous journey across Mexico. You could not pay smugglers and traffickers thousands of dollars to get to our southern border and then expect to be let in. If you let them in, more will come. That's why we have a crisis at the border. General Van Herc. 
we've been supporting the Department of Homeland Security at the border for some time now with DOD personnel. Um, the most recent adjust, major adjustment in numbers was in 2018, is that right? That's correct. Uh, we, in 2018, then this year, we're up to uh, nearly 4,000 total numbers. And, and has the status of the border changed from 2018 to March of 2021? When you say status of the border, can you Just clarify? The, the conditions there um, and whether or not we're closer to having a secure border or we have a less secure border now than we did when this uh, per major personnel change first started. I, I would defer to Homeland Security for the security of the border. We're in direct support of Homeland Security for that mission. I can tell you the numbers of uh, migrants coming across has dramatically, dramatically increased here in recent months. And what kind of strain does that put on our personnel at the border? Our personnel being DOD? DOD personnel. Uh, DOD continues to provide support to Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection. Uh, mainly in the detection and monitoring. A uh, total number of 4,000 does not place an incredible strain on the force and has not shown significant uh, uh, strategic readiness of our ability to accomplish our missions. I've seen some media reports uh, that suggest in addition to economic migrants who are not eligible for asylum showing up at our border from Latin America, uh, that we are now beginning to see um, foreign nationals from other countries in Africa and Asia. Uh, to your knowledge, is that correct? Senator, I'm aware of intelligence reports that corroborate exactly what you just said. What kind of threat does it uh, pose to our country that persons might be traveling from the old world to the new world to join these migrant flows? Uh, I believe that uh, we must continue to monitor uh, anybody who has nefarious uh, desires for our country. Uh, homeland defense, uh, border security is national security, which equals homeland defense. Uh, there will be people take advantage of the opportunity uh, to come across that border. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, General Van Herc. I mean, if our border is open, anyone from around the world can get to Mexico and try to cross our border, not just to seek a better life here, but to harm or ultimately try to kill our own people. And I go back to the simple point. If you let them in, more will come. All the controversy you see in the media are misplaced, talking about how fast we're processing migrants through these detention facilities or whether they have enough showers or beds or cots. If you don't let them in the first place, you don't have to worry about the conditions in the detention centers. The Biden administration has to reverse course. There are three simple solutions. First, it should reapply the public health declaration under Title 42 to all foreign nationals. To, including minor, to include minors, just like the Trump administration did, as the Biden administration still does for adults. Second, it should renegotiate a new migrant protection protocol with Mexico, which it tore up for no reason on its first days in office. And third, it should reenter a safe third country agreement with Guatemala. If you're seeking asylum at our border, there's no reason you cannot seek asylum in Guatemala. That was the lesson of the last administration. Those three things alone will solve our crisis at the border, and they all can be done tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Senator Cotton. Uh, Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Admiral Fowler, I want to follow up on the comments made about the border crisis. Um, the, uh, it is a crisis, and there are important things that we must do. I want to uh, puncture the uh, partisan uh, finger pointing that's been done, because it's a crisis I think that we all have to to solve the notion that this was fine, bad under the Obama administration, fine under the Trump administration, and now bad again is just not realistic. Um, during the Obama administration, we worked together in Congress on a comprehensive immigration reform bill that would have poured billions, tens of billions of dollars into border security. It was bipartisan in the Senate. It could go nowhere in a Republican-dominated House. Wouldn't even get a committee hearing. During the Trump administration, we came up with a plan that was bipartisan in February of 2018 that would have protected dreamers and put $25 billion into border security, every penny that the president had asked for. And when the bill was introduced with 16 co-sponsors, eight Democrats, eight Republicans, the Trump administration, having said that they would sign the bill, you put it on my desk, I'll sign it, is what the president told many of us. They decided within a day that they so didn't like dreamers, that they were willing to turn away $25 billion in border security. We missed an opportunity in 2013 to put about $40 billion into border security because of a Republican House. We missed an opportunity in 2018 
to put $25 billion in border security because the president didn't like dreamers. Now, I don't say that to suggest that the problem at the border is the fault of one party or another. It is a challenge. We all have to deal with it, and we have to find solutions. And I share my colleagues' views that one of the solutions is putting some tough laws in place and enforcing them. I think the asylum rules are maybe um, need to be tightened up. I want to correct my colleague. He asked you a question about asylum rules and asked if there was persecution for another reason, but he left out persecution based on political status. I can assure you in the Northern Triangle, having lived there, there is significant persecution in the nations in the Northern Triangle against political dissidents, against journalists, against environmental activists. And there has been a history of persecution against indigenous people. There are some other groups that my colleague is right. They're not being persecuted directly now, but political opponents are. In Honduras, where I lived, the OAS said after the last presidential election that the election should be rerun because they were so corrupt. Instead, the U.S. recognized the corrupt government and then cut off aid to the corrupt government. And then what we see today, as you said, Admiral Fowler, is sort of a perfect storm. If we don't invest in security and economics, there will be economic refugees. And my colleague is right. An economic refugee is not entitled to asylum status. But nevertheless, if we are not working to promote security and economic improvement, there is a natural consequence to that. So we need tougher border security. We need to increase investments in security assistance in the region. We need to hold uh, authoritarians accountable rather than turn a blind eye to their misdeeds. Um, these are things that we can do and we can do together. Um, General Ron Herc, I want to ask you a question. Canada is a pretty good ally of the United States militarily, aren't they? Absolutely, Senator. In my conversations with the Canadian Foreign Minister and the Canadian Minister of Defense, it has been a sore point with them that the U.S. uses national security waivers against them to impose tariffs. We have trade disputes with Canada over milk, over lumber products, over all kinds of things. That's not unusual given the sizable border that we share. But they expressed to me a particular concern when the previous administration labels them a national security threat. And they point out, hey, we fight with you in every war. We're side by side with you in military hospitals at Langdell and elsewhere. Have you heard a similar concern expressed uh, dissatisfaction from the Canadian side about the U.S. using national security, label that, labeling them a national security threat in order to impose tariffs? Senator, in my discussions with the Minister of National Defense, the Deputy, and also the Chief of the Defense Staff, I have not been engaged or had that discussion. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Now via WebEx, Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, good morning. I thank you for both of your continued dedication uh, to our country and for your previous service. Uh, let me begin. Um, I'd like to start with Admiral Fowler. Um, understanding and combating Russian and Chinese influence operations truly is critical uh, to our national security. Um, Senator Gillibrand began this discussion with you a little while ago, talking about what uh, was happening in, in, in our southern regions. Admiral Fowler, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about what our options are, what the tools are that are available to you to counteract that misinformation and how, what tools you may need right now or what additional assistance you need in order to be able to counteract some of the misinformation that currently is occurring. I can't stress enough the, the full court uh, press that China has on to gain their economic dominance in their version of a world order uh, globally and in this hemisphere, which I look at this hemisphere as the front line of competition. And we have to approach that as such as a U.S. government across all elements of power with the diplomats and uh, in the lead, clearly. Uh, military plays a role. We've, we've, our principal method to block uh, Chinese military interests, uh, the PLA, is by staying engaged with our partners in our exercise program, our IMET program. These are world class. China's tried to copy them. They've tried to, to uh, replicate Leavenworth in Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, we need to remain the best at what we do and ensure we, we provide the volume that is needed 
to allow our hemisphere partners to be professional and partner with us. In the IT space, uh, we have to stay engaged to understand what they're up to. That goes back to intelligence resources. So I would sum this up by saying additional intelligence assets, continued security cooperation, and increased volume of IMET and exercises, and then enough assets to stay in the field. That includes our small special operations force teams, which are very effective. And last year, we received great support from the United States Army to put some small security force assistance teams in places like Colombia and Honduras, which are having great effect to train, and it's only training, not accompany our, our partners. Thank you, General. General Van Erk, um, right now, you've got on a day-to-day -day basis, you clearly have more individuals trying to cross the border uh, into the United States. There's no question about that. And clearly that's something which most certainly in, in, in your supporting role will take up a fair part of your day. But at the same time, you have one of the mo most critical uh, responsibilities out there, uh, defending the homeland against those, those possibilities of a strategic attack. Today, we have this discussion going on about the need for the triad, the continuation of our triad, and also for the need to provide specific defense protection against incoming weapon systems. Can you talk about the connectivity or the connection between having all three legs of the triad available and also needing uh, to still have the ability to defend the homeland? And if we were to take away any one of the legs of the triad, what that would do in terms of increasing the challenge for you of defending the homeland with missile systems set up to uh, protect against incoming weapon systems? Sure, Senator. Uh, first, uh, the, the nuclear deterrent and the triad uh, remains the foundation of homeland defense. Uh, I would defer to Admiral Richard on specifics about the triad. I know that the triad today uh, was designed uh, for specific capabilities to uh, basically uh, uh, take the, the calculus of any threat and uh, create deterrence options because of the flexibility that the triad creates. Uh, the most reactive forces are uh, ICBMs. The most flexible force is the bombers, and certainly the most survivable force is the submarines. Each of those contribute significantly to homeland defense. Uh, we haven't had a great power conflict since World War II, and this, uh, the triad and the nuclear deterrent has been part of that. Uh, with that said, uh, our competitors today are trying to circumvent uh, the nuclear triad and develop, have developed and stated intent to attack the homeland uh, because they assume they can uh, be successful to destroy our will below the nuclear threshold. I'm concerned about having the ability to give decision makers key decision space uh, in that realm, uh, but not all in-game defeat. And so deterrence by denial is what I talk about, and that is giving options uh, to senior leaders to create doubt in a competitor or adversary's mind about their ability to achieve their objectives with a strike on the homeland, Senator. Thank, Thank you. you. My, My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Rounds. And now let me recognize Senator King via WebEx. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. And uh, General, I'd like to follow up on a comment made at the end by, uh, of her questioning by Senator Shaheen and asking, in your professional military opinion, uh, would it be in the interest of the United States to uh, accede to the law of the sea treaty? Senator, yes, it, it would be. It gives us a, a better posture, a seat at the table, more credibility when we work many of the issues that we have to work uh, around the globe with allies, partners, and potential competitors. And that's, and that's particularly true in the Arctic, isn't it? That's where the Russians are staking claims as we speak. Uh, Senator, I agree with your assessment. And as uh, Russia takes over the Arctic Council in May, uh, it's never been more crucial for us with our like-minded nations and allies and partners that we come to agreement to not allow Russia and China to exploit any seams and gaps. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'd like to turn uh, for a moment to the immigration question and the crisis at the border, which everyone recognizes. Uh, Admiral Fowler, I think at the beginning of your testimony, you pointed out that there were sufficient, there were significant, what I call push factors 
as well as the uh, change of administration, which is a pull factor, but the combination of the impact of COVID, the two major hurricanes and the transnational gangs is making life intolerable for people in those uh, Northern Triangle countries. Is that not also true? Senator, I've met with uh, folks who have walked all the way to the border and come back and their, their drive was the violence, the, the fear for their life, their lack of food for their families, the insecurity. And in this past year, uh, we've had that perfect storm of additional factors, COVID, and then back-to-back -back major hurricanes. Um, the, the region is fragile. Uh, the conditions uh, are on par with our Great Depression, and uh, our engagement is critical uh, to uh, help our partner nations um, overcome this uh, challenge. It, it strikes me that whatever we do on border security, and I'm fully supportive of, of a secure border, uh, as long as we have these three countries near our border uh, that are in such terrible shape, uh, people are going to continue to try to find ways to, to escape. Uh, I've heard the term, of, we need a Marshall Plan for that region in order to try to stabilize these countries in terms of their own internal security, their own economies. Is that, is that, uh, does that ring any bells for you? Uh, Senator, I think a Marshall uh, Plan would be a, a, a wonderful model as we look at uh, the entire hemisphere, really, and look at the, the sources of instability across the hemisphere. In addition to Central America, uh, we see uh, Haiti, uh, Cuba, and Venezuela, all sources of uh, illegal migration to the United States. In Venezuela alone, five million uh, migrants now have swelled out of their borders. Uh, uh, we we need the big ideas. We need the sustained engagement of the all of nations and the whole of government of the United States and the Department of Defense plays a role, particularly in that professionalism and institutional capacity building so their security forces do the right thing and contribute to overall sustainable security. You, you mentioned, mentioned in your in your testimony the Russian and Chinese disinformation campaigns in these countries. Are they also uh, encouraging migration as a way to undermine uh, the U.S.? Do they see this as a as a weapon, uh, just as they did with the Syrian migration into into Europe several years ago? The the uh, disinformation by Russia seeks to discredit every act of goodness, and we do many uh, that the United States uh, provides in the hemisphere. And to the extent that drives migration, there's no doubt. Uh, China seeks their own influence, their own uh, economic dominance, and uh, they seek clients while we seek uh, friends and partners. I, I think their, their information campaign best exhibited by a recent visit to a country where I was asked about the illegal uh, and unregulated, unreported fishing in the region, and I cited the example of Chinese involvement off of Ecuador uh, where their fleets would, for great periods of time, go silent and uh, sweep into the ecological preserve. And then within minutes after my facts-based statement, which is based on the various credible sources, the Chinese uh, uh, proceeded to attack me and the media. That's just typical of their disinformation globally, Senator. Well, I, I'm out of time, but I think your testimony that you, A, don't have adequate ISR resources, and B, there are not enough ships to interdict the drugs that are coming and killing Americans, including more than one a day in my home state, uh, is very powerful. And that's a matter, uh, that's within our control. That's a matter of allocation of resources. And I hope this committee uh, can bring some pressure on the, uh, on the administration to allocate adequate resources for ISR and for interdiction, because we're not even interdicting the drug shipments we know about, uh, let alone uh, finding ones that uh, additional ISR could provide. So that's something that I hope this committee can work on. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both uh, for your testimony. It's been very uh, illuminating today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator King. Let me recognize Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today and for your service to our great nation and the men and women within your commands. We truly appreciate everything they do for us every day. Um, Gen or, excuse me, Admiral Fowler, um, we had a great conversation last week and you really stressed to me the importance of our neighborhood. And I want to continue visiting about that today because we do need to be very aware, and I think this committee is, but that 
we have a lot of uh, nefarious influencers within our own neighborhood. And I would like to talk a little bit about those uh, transnational criminal organizations, as well as those that may be um, influencing those TCOs and where that's coming from. So uh, you've provided the placemats for us today, China, Iran, Russia, they're all influencers in our neighborhood and they're all operating. We see the TCOs as well. Uh, they are operating to our south and they're bringing in about $90 billion of revenue annually. Uh, that is very concerning to me. And then the increase of movement across our borders is something troubling that we've all been talking about today. And we have to make sure that we're defending that border and pushing back against these influencers. So let's talk a little bit about the TCOs um, and what they are doing in the Southcom AOR and are they working alongside China, Russia, and Iran? The, the transnational criminal organizations are just murderous, violent organizations. They're murdering people, driving migration, and they're fueled on corruption. And so when I look at the interconnection of these organizations and the China-Russia players in our hemisphere, I look at corruption as a common element. It, it's, uh, it fuels both. Then we look at lack of regard for human rights, and there's a commonality there. And then we look at lack of regard for rules-based international order or rules in general, and there's a commonality there. So there is an interconnection. The money laundering connection is the most significant, where Chinese money laundering underwrites uh, TCOs a significant portion, and that's um, something that we're tracking as part of all of interagency effort here in the United States. And so this corrosive influence undermines our democracies and contributes to the fragility and the security concerns we have right in proximity to the United States. Location, location, location drives everything, and that location uh, is so important in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So uh, as Senator Shaheen was asking about uh, Chinese influence, so there's above the board operations going on with China where they're maybe engaging in legal activities, uh, but then you're saying they engage in these criminal activities as well and under the radar type of criminal organizations. So the national defense strategy and our secretary's guidance uh, cites China as the pacing challenge. And, and I uh, side with what the Indo-PACOM commander said. It's the most significant threat we face in the 21st century. And, and we look at, we want this competition to work out peacefully and not end in conflict and not be adversarial. But Chinese, in addition to the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, is involved in illegal mining, illegal log logging, uh, they are at least tacitly supporting uh, the money laundering. Uh, they are using uh, COVID and vaccines as a hammer to further the Chinese Communist Party interests, particularly to get better deals for Huawei and 5G and to try to drive a wedge between the remaining countries that support Taiwan. And the majority of those are here in this hemisphere. So yes, Senator, their uh, corrosive, insidious influences being felt right here in our neighborhood. Yeah, thank you, Admiral. And I appreciate our discussion to that effect last week. And General Van Herc, in the remaining time that I have, um, we've had a number of our own troops working the southern border, which I think has been extremely important. They've been supporting United States Customs and Border Patrol. Are they still playing a vital role in the defense of our nation at our southern border? Senator, probably best answered by CBP and DHS. My recent visit uh, would tell you that uh, we are playing a role to enable them to do their law enforcement role by providing support. Uh, when I look at the, the challenges that transnational criminal organizations create on the border, uh, the symptoms that we're seeing are the migration, the, the human trafficking, uh, the counter narcotics. Uh, from a homeland defense perspective, Mexico being in the United States NORTHCOM AOR, and two major transnational criminal organizations with the uh, Sinaloa and New Jalisco, uh, we have a national security imperative with 
regards to the instability that they create, the tragedies they create, and the opportunities they create for nefarious actors such as China or Russia right on our own southern border to have access and influence. And so it concerns me very much, Senator. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen, very much. And I appreciate uh, you safeguarding our neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Let me recognize Senator Warren via WebEx. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Admiral Fowler and General Van Herrick for being here today. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, General Van Herrick, uh, COVID-19 vaccinations are well underway all across our country, and the DOD is helping uh, people get vaccinated. Each day, millions more Americans are receiving hope in the form of these vaccines as we move closer to defeating this pandemic. But the data show that the vaccines aren't reaching every community equally. Death rates for Black Americans and Native Americans, Native Alaskans, are nearly twice as high as the death rates in white communities. But the vaccines have disproportionately gone to white Americans. Although vaccine demographic data are incomplete at this point, it appears that only about 7% of the 65 million administered doses have gone to black Americans. So General Van Herrick, can you, several thousand of the troops you command have been deployed to assist the federal government's vaccination efforts. Can you explain how Northern Command made decisions about the deployment of vaccine teams to ensure that communities of color are getting the vaccines that they desperately need? Senator, absolutely. Uh, United States Northern Command does not make the decision where teams go. Uh, that's due uh, through the FEMA process, and we uh, answer to their mission assignment and go to the locations determined by that interagency process. Uh, fair, fair enough. enough. Do you, you know, know if FEMA is prioritizing communities of color? In my discussions with the acting director, uh, Mr. Fenton, uh, they do take all considerations in from state and local officials, uh, governors that are asking for support and factoring in uh, those specifics. And based on the need of uh, where the transmission rates are the highest, they do take all that in from my discussions. Well, well it's, it's hard then to explain why we're down at 7% uh, vaccination rate for uh, black Americans. Can I ask you to commit that in future discussions, as you're talking about how to deploy these teams, that you will support making sure that we're making adequate vaccination efforts in communities of color? Senator, I commit to you that I'm agnostic uh, with regards to where we provide support, and I'll work closely with the FEMA uh, team to make sure we do that. Well. well I'd, I'd, I'd like, like to hear that you're not agnostic, but that you're really committed to helping in the communities of color that are being hit hardest and where we're seeing the highest death rates. You know, I, 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 I I'm apologize. also concerned. I'm sorry. Go I ahead. Apologize. I apologize. I am fully committed. I, I thought I said that the second part. Okay. Absolutely. I, I hope so. so. Um, I'm also concerned about reports of Russian misinformation campaigns against the vaccine that are aimed at reducing the number of Americans willing to get vaccinated. Can you just say a word about what strategies is Northern Command using to combat this misinformation? Senator, it's an information and education uh, campaign, uh, primarily within our, our own forces. I'm happy to report to you that we have approximately 85% rate, acceptance rate within the command. Uh, in my discussions with the Secretary of Defense, uh, and within the interagency, we've talked and shared the lessons learned about how to educate and uh, also uh, exploit or expose the uh, disinformation. So I think that's crucial to combine both the education aspect and exposing the disinformation. Oh, thank, thank you. You know, yes. this pandemic hasn't affected all Americans equally. Black and brown communities have disproportionately suffered from COVID-19, and its effects will likely be felt for years. Northern Command and the federal government's vaccination efforts must prioritize the hardest hit communities. And I hope that you will continue to work hard to ensure that the vaccine goes to those who need it most. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Chillis, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your decades of service. Uh, General Van Herk, I want to go back and just finish 
<clears throat> or make sure I understood with respect to uh, any DOD resources supporting local mission objectives around vaccine dissemination, you're there to basically provide personnel support after the decisions about where to administer the vaccines, which population should be prioritized. You're not actively involved in that prioritization process. Is that correct? Senator, that is exactly correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Admiral, I had a, uh, just maybe a, an addendum to the request that uh, uh, Senator Wicker made following on to uh, Senator Shaheen's comments. This, this one graphic that shows China influence, uh, I think what would be helpful in there is just to show American influence, but also to show the trend lines. My guess is based on a, a comment that you made, they're trending in the wrong direction. So I think it would just be helpful when you provide that graphic to uh, show us the areas, the, uh, the, the hot, so the heat map on where we really need to muster more resources. Uh, on the, uh, the TCO graphic, uh, you all summarized the, uh, the disruption in terms of narcotics, I think uh, 303 metric tons in FY20. Uh, how does that compare to FY19 and what are the trend lines for FY21? In, in overall amounts, Senator, it's, uh, it's comparable, but what's significant about FY20 is the impact of global pandemic. So we know that uh, for a time, the, uh, the narco traffickers went to ground and didn't, didn't push as much of their product. And so, and then when they did, because a lot of border controls were tighter and the methods of delivery were harder because economies had shut down and they, they ride their traffic on the backs of the economy. So they were having difficulty getting precursor chemicals and so on. Uh, when they did start pushing it, it was in, in smaller loads in, in different routes. What's significant about the DOD's performance and as part of uh, the whole nation effort, uh, really are, what we do is we detect and monitor and pass that off to law enforcement is that we never, we never stepped back, we stepped up in the face of pandemic and we accounted for a significant increase of the amount that we targeted. So while the total amount was the same, our percentage of getting at effective targets was up. And that was because we did uh, have a modest increase in resources throughout the year. We had the Na United States Navy stepped up uh, at the direction of the SECDEF with Navy ships, additional P-8s, and the Coast Guard sustained their always excellent support. And what we saw is when the U.S. stayed on the field, our partners stayed on the field. So overall, we held the line as part of the effort. We'll never interdict our way out, but we've got to keep pressure on that part of the supply chain. The Colombians did their part. They had a record eradication year. Uh, where we need to go next is in the finances, into their data, into that source of their power, and, and really break the center of gravity of these organizations I think we can do that more effectively with uh, a better effective targeting and whole government approach here in the U.S. and training our partners to do the same. Thank you. Uh, something that would be helpful if, if you don't have it available. I'd also be interested in a uh, similar update on human trafficking disruption. Uh, if we could just get that submitted for the record, I would appreciate it. Uh, at the, the southern tip of your area of responsibility, uh, General Van Herc, and, and, uh, and Admiral the Northern. Uh, what's, the, what's, what's the change in posture? What's the, uh, the environment like now as compared to, say, this time last year? I mean, military presence, I know even at the southern border, the southwest border of the United States, we had stepped up Mexican military presence. What is that? Uh, how would you summarize that today? And then also the southern uh, Mexico border and uh, border states. What's their posture there trying to manage flow of uh, immigrants moving across those borders now compared to a year ago? I'll go first. From the from Mexicans' uh, perspective, they're tremendous partners. We have a fantastic military. To military. Are they maintaining the same sort of operations tempo that they, they have for the past year or so? They are. They've been great partners. The same for Guatemala. They've, uh, they're committed. They're committed to doing the right thing here, but they're stressed with uh, COVID and the other insecurity uh, by the transnational criminal organizations. So their ability to, to surge more uh, in the migrant problem says is limited. Thank you, As we move forward uh, with uh, funding and, and NDA this year, I'd also be interested in maybe you submitting for the record key uh, funding flows that are trending in the wrong direction that we should focus on when we get uh, back to 
uh, appropriations discussions and any sort of authorities you may need in the NDA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. And let me recognize Senator Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank both of our panelists for their service to our country, and we appreciate it very much you being here today. Uh, Admiral Fowler, uh, I don't think it's possible to overstate the threats our adversaries are posting in your area of responsibility in AFRICOM uh, because they know whatever investments they make in South America and Africa are cheap and will pay dividends in the future. Uh, at the end of February, U.S. Army South finished pre-deployment training for Operation Alamo Shield to prepare First Security Force Assistant Brigade personnel for future missions in Colombia, Honduras, and Panama. In addition to our state partnership programs, ongoing training and advising operations like this one on the crucial for promoting interoperability and relationship building your area of responsibility. So my question would be, what specific training programs in Southcom going to develop to increase the capabilities and the capacity and to further combat the growing concern for corruption within the ranks of our partners, and especially with the migration that we have going on right now? Can't they play a bigger role in that, sir? Senator, I'd like to commend the West Virginia Guard, which does fantastic work through the state partnership program with Peru and, uh, and has been an active participant in our exercise program. You cited the security force assistance teams that the United States Army has developed. That is exactly the right uh, capability. It's small. It's small teams that focus on training. You think four or five people. And, and our partners want to emulate the professionalism of the United States Army, United States Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, Marines. And that's the way forward. Stay engaged on the team, on the field with the small teams that train our partners' trainers in the professional use of force that involve women, peace, and security training, that involve human rights training. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the way to go, and we're continuing to emphasize and strengthen those programs, Senator. Thank you, sir. And uh, to General Van Herc, uh, our current major ballistic missile defense SS around the globe include the GBM and D, THAAD batteries, Aegis systems, and PAC-3 um, missile capability. As China and Russia continue to increase their influence abroad, I am concerned that their objectives provide them with the ability to die us access, break apart our relationships, further corrupt governments, and ultimately place threats closer to the U.S. However, as we begin to think in terms of hypersonic threats, geographical location doesn't mean much anymore. And the importance of early detection and coordination between the combat commandments uh, becomes an even more crucial concern. So our question is, as we continue to develop space-based sensor layers, what role do you see for NORTHCOM and NORAD in tracking threats in North America, as well as interfacing with other combatant command commands to track threats such as, such as hypersonics? Senator, my NORAD hat, we're directly responsible for integrated threat warning and attack assessment. Uh, so that's crucial. We will continue to play a crucial role uh, for assessment of threats to the homeland, specifically from missile threats. I am concerned about the ability going forward to uh, track and assess hypersonics. And so we must go to space. And in my recent discussions uh, just this Friday, talking with uh, John Hill at the Missile Defense Agency, they're moving out. What we have to provide is space-based capabil space capabilities to track hypersonics, especially as they maneuver. And those space-based capabilities have to provide fire control capability data to systems that will be able to engage hypersonics. That's crucial for that deterrence by denial aspect that I uh, mentioned earlier that also contributes to overarching deterrence. Uh, is there a requirement for a liaison cell, a liaison cell uh, to... Uh at each of our combatant command that represents the other commands in order to build situational wellness to coordinate the efforts? Senator, I, I believe Homeland Defense starts forward, and that means all combatant commands must be engaged and part of the overarching solution for Homeland Defense and missile defense. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Manchin. Uh, let me now recognize Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your service. Good to see both of you again, Admiral. It's been a while. Thank you for all you're doing down south. Uh, General, I want to focus on some issues I know that have already been mentioned. Um, first, on missile defense. One, one, I think, good news story. It doesn't 
doesn't uh, make a lot of press, but in the last few years, there's been a strong bipartisan support in this committee, in this Congress, on building up our missile defenses, I think in part because of the threat from North Korea. However, there's been challenges, right? Right now, we have 20 empty silos at Fort Greeley, which makes no sense. Some estimates are it's going to be 10 years before we have missiles in there. Can you talk to me about that and why and why in the world aren't we filling those silos as soon as possible? Senator, my goal would be to have additional capability and capacity as soon as possible. I continue to work close with John Hill at the Missile Defense Agency. My top priority is to stay on timeline to field additional capabilities against ballistic missiles uh, that could attack our homeland. And isn't that in part because there's in intel that given the rate of what North Korea is producing in terms of nukes and intercontinental ballistic missiles that their capability could overwhelm our capabilities as early as 2025? Senator, I'd like to have that conversation in a classified environment. I remain extremely concerned about uh, the capacity of the ballistic missile defense system uh, going forward. And would quickly fielding the NGI help with addressing that challenge? The sooner we can field the NGI, the, the better for addressing that challenge. There was an article in a defense media news source recently saying that the NGI decision is on the Deputy Secretary of Defense's desk and yet it's being delayed. Some are thinking that she might kind of use this as a budget cutting tool to say maybe we don't need it. Is that a good idea to delay this and uh, have the Pentagon say we don't need NGI right now? Senator, I'll stay out of the policy aspect of that. Well, you kind of already dumped into it. So let me get your personal opinion on that. Is that a good idea for the deputy secretary or the secretary to say, hmm, I'm going to cut. Let's figure out where we can cut the budget. Let's cut the budget on the system that protects the entire United States of America from a clear and growing threat. Is that a good idea? Again, that's a policy decision of my, my uh, perspective is about the risk, and I remain very concerned about the risk of having a uh, capable ballistic missile defense system against future capacity changes and capability changes by threats. Would the risk increase if we cut the NGI uh, program? Uh, my in your personal opinion? In my, uh, in my opinion, uh, cutting that would reduce our capability to defend against uh, increased capacity and capability of any threats. Mr. Chairman, this is a huge issue, and I think we as a committee, as been very bipartisan, need to send a message to the Pentagon like, hey, fund this now. Um, it's clear it would be a risk to the country. Let me, uh, let me turn to the Arctic. Um, I know there's been a number of discussions already. Uh, the good news is in his confirmation hearing, General Secretary Austin, the Deputy Secretary, Dr. Hicks, both said they were committed to this committee to fully fund the new um, Arctic strategies. I think the Army is going to introduce it today um, with regard to fully funding the different service-oriented strategies. Um, Senator Wicker talked about icebreakers. It's good we're finally building them. It's taking too long. There is this leasing option that the Trump administration was looking at at the end of the administration, and now the Biden administration is looking at hard. Do you think that's a good idea to close this icebreaker gap with the opportunity to lease icebreakers, get them home ported in America's Arctic, uh, which is Alaska? What's your thought on that? Senator, that's a policy decision. I have a requirement for capability. I'm agnostic to what provides that capability. But you think we need the capability? Absolutely. Good. So do I. So does this committee, by the way. Um, let me ask one final thing. There's going to be a meeting, high-level meeting, between our diplomats and Chinese diplomats in Anchorage uh, Thursday and Friday. We talk about Alaska in terms of the Arctic, but as you know, uh, General, Alaska also uh, is critical for the Asia Pacific, particularly as we look at dispersing of our forces. We had the PACOM commander here last week talking about challenges perhaps in the Taiwan Strait as early as five to six years from now. How important is it, do you think, that the Chinese, when they come to Alaska, see that there's, within the end of this year, going to be over 100 fifth-generation fighters based in Alaska that can get to the Taiwan Strait probably in six hours? 
Uh, Senator, Alaska is a strategic location. Uh, it's a strategic location for homeland defense, something that we must preserve and preserve that capability. I think it's important that they see our capabilities. It's part of our overarching deterrence. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Let me recognize Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, gentlemen. Thank you for your uh, testimony uh, here today and for your service uh, every day. General uh, Van Herc, a, a seldom discussed area of the uh, civil support mission is chemical, biological, radiological, and, and nuclear response. And uh, this is uh, good considering the subject uh, matter, but uh, as long as uh, supporting units are resourced appropriately, uh, we can be more assured. So my question is uh, to you, sir, is that the command and control CBRN response element B has experienced a cumulative 25% decrease in funding over the past uh, three years. And I understand these are Title 32 funds, and I know that you don't control uh, those funds, but the effect should at least be of concern to you because uh, uh, of the unit uh, augments Northern Command for CBRN and DSCA more broadly. So my question to you, General, is does the decrease for the Guard and Reserve C2 element reflect your priorities? or those of the Army North and uh, Joint Task Force Civil Support? First, I would say I remain confident in my ability to provide uh, support in case there's an incident, chemical, biological, radiological, uh, in the continental United States. With regards to the uh, specific uh, prioritization, I would say uh, that I need to get further detail on the cut for Title 32, I'm not tracking that, but we're well, uh, well, well integrated with state and local uh, authorities and have our capability ready to go, some of it on uh, hours notice, uh, others on days notice. So I'm confident in my ability to pr uh, perform that mission. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, and you're willing to take a look at that and, and get back to us, we could follow up with you? I will. I appreciate that, thank, thank you. Admiral Fowler, uh, the Southern Command takes a, a, a non-traditional uh, approach to intelligence, integrating public information uh, with advanced uh, analytics, artificial intelligence, uh, and machine learning. Uh, my question is, is this in-house uh, RDT and E uh, effort unique uh, to the Southern Command? The uh, non-traditional efforts that you speak of through our uh, Special Operations Force, looks at big data and uh, what the enemy's doing in big data is commercial available information, machine learning, artificial in intelligence. It's, uh, it is a unique effort that is now being replicated, and it is a, a key area that we need to emphasize in our intelligence um, efforts going forward, appropriately working within the U.S. whole government. Uh, this data, it's data that my shipmate, General Van Herc, talks about, and the uh, stovepipes in that data that we create with our own policies have to be broken down so we can leverage that to understand what the threat's doing. And certainly our malign actors that are working this hemisphere, China and Russia, they don't respect laws when they look at exploiting that type of data for their own benefit. Uh, you mentioned some of that's being replicated. Are you, are, there, are you aware of some similar successful methods with other combatant commands uh, or the intelligence community? We have another uh, a pilot program that we've worked to look at uh, cryptocurrency. In this hemisphere, with only 8% of the world's population, 60% of the cryptocurrency uh, is being leveraged, and that's because of the plethora of transnational criminal organizations that are uh, wreaking violence in, in the hemisphere. And so th that's a concern. So how do we get at that s center of gravity to break the backs of these threats working with Treasury and other partners in, in support of. We're, we're not looking to take the lead here. We're looking to play the appropriate role. So there are efforts, and those efforts are, uh, frankly, funded every year on uh, unfunded uh, requests or through uh, additional support from Congress. So we need to appropriately sustain that going forward. Thank you. On Thursday, NORTHCOM will begin a global information dominance exercise. Uh, and I understand that nine of the 11 Combatant commands are planning to participate in this exercise, which is meant to prototype and test a, a set of uh, I, a, or AI tools. And I know that there was some discussion about Pathfinder earlier, uh, but the intent is to support uh, joint all demand command and control implementation. So my question for, for you, General, is can you explain why these types of exercise are absolutely critical to our modernization and readiness efforts and why NORTHCOM is leading this initiative? Absolutely, Senator. Uh, 
from the NORTHCOM and NORAD perspective, we view data and information as a strategic asset. And so we're conducting these exercises to, to bring everybody together to show the true value and the importance uh, of the strategic ability that we can utilize uh, information and data. And so uh, we look forward to continuing to partner with the uh, combatant commands and services uh, and bringing them together to demonstrate capabilities that can not only uh, help us in conflict, but more importantly, help us uh, de-escalate in crisis and to deter in competition. Great. Thank you, General. Thank you, Thank you Senator Peters. Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank both of you for being here. Generals, I appreciate your, your service, Admiral, and uh, in general. Um, I'm going to start with you, Admiral, uh, because early on, in a re response to a question from Senator Inhofe, you had um, cited the fact that you only get 1% of the ISR. And that was fairly stunning to me, especially since the Air Force has been trying to um, to uh, retire the RQ-4s and cut the production of the MQ-9s, two systems that we're very familiar with in North Dakota, of course. Uh, they're operated quite effectively out of, uh, out of our state, one by the Air Force uh, in Grand Force, the other by our, our Guard in Fargo. And one of the reasons that they use for wanting to cut production or retire um, and, and realize in some of it they want to save money for new systems, and that's, that's noble, and we, we need to make some tough decisions about that. Um, but one of the reasons they use is that these platforms aren't survivable in near peer competition. So my question to you, Admiral, is could you use RQ-4s and MQ-9s in your theater, and is there a significant threat to the survival of the, these platforms at Southcom? Well, as you mentioned, Senator, um, we received less than 1% of the, the DOD ISR, and, and it's a prioritization, and there's global challenges, and I recognize uh, how that, that plays out. Uh, this is a good environment in Southcom for unmanned. We have had, an, uh, for the first time ever, an MQ-9 through the past year, and we have Customs and Border Protection MQ-9 as well. And they've proven their utility uh, because they can stay on station for a long time and stare at the threats. Uh, they can also learn, in general, about the environment beyond the transnational criminal organization threats. So we have uh, the understanding that we need to ensure that we're appropriately postured moving forward. Thank you, Admiral. G General, thank you for the, our discussion last week. I enjoyed it very much, found it very interesting, learned a lot, as is often the case. Um, and one of the things that you and I talked about, of course, was the, the fact that uh, NORAD NORTHCOM uh, participated with the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory in an over-the-horizon study that included uh, some testing at Camp Grafton, North Dakota, our, our National Guard camp, as part of the uh, OSD Coalition Warfare Program funded Arctic HF surveillance program. And we were told, of course, that the results uh, ex exceeded expectations. Uh, m my question to you is, do you still see the need for an over-the-horizon radar system and, and capability, and do you expect further, more advanced testing anytime soon? Senator, my uh, focus in, in top priority is domain awareness. And over-the-horizon radar would certainly contribute to domain awareness. Uh, my understanding is right now, with regards to the uh, uh, test that you're talking about. The current uh, Northern Strategic Approaches study is with the Air Force. We're waiting for that to come out. I talked to General Brown on Friday about that. Uh, once that report comes out, we'll be uh, in a better position to see on the way forward with the research lab or however we're going to pursue that. But uh, domain awareness is at the top of my integrated priority list. Thank you for that. And thanks, thanks for that answer. And thanks for uh, following up with General Brown. Um, one other question for you, General Van Herc. There's uh, a lot less military president presence between Michigan and Montana in the northern, you know, obviously uh, along the northern border than there used to be during the Cold War. Even though, I mean, one could argue that there's there are more threats in the Arctic and, and from missiles coming over the Arctic um, even than there were during the Cold War. If there was a threat coming over the pole through Saskatchewan, say, do, do you have enough? fighters, tankers, missile warning, missile defense systems to meet that threat? Uh, Senator, day to day, I'm confident in my ability to defend against the threat uh, that we have. Uh, today, day to day, I'm postured primarily against a 9-11 type of response. If indications and warning or crisis evolved, I would go ahead and ha have a ask for uh, additional forces. At that time, if I was allocated additional forces or not, I'd have to make a broader assessment in my ability to defend. Well, as you mentioned, um, obviously, domain awareness is, a, you know, the, the critical aspect to 
being prepared. Um, is the radar coverage for that area modern enough to track um, any threat reliably, do you believe? Uh, Senator, I remain concerned about domain awareness in the north with the legacy north warning system. Uh, if we apply capabilities such as Pathfinder, that'll increase my capability, but uh, more broadly, we need to get after it with more modern systems. Systems not designed to go after a stovepipe, single uh, domain, single threat. We need systems capable of going after everything from small counter UAS to ballistic missiles uh, that are able to be efficient and effective. Excellent. Thank you. You're both awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Now I'd like to recognize Senator Rosen via WebEx. Thank you, Chairman Reed, and I want to thank uh, the witnesses for being here and for your great uh, service to our nation. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about Hezbollah in the Western Hemisphere, because for decades, Iran's proxy Hezbollah has maintained an active presence in the Western Hemisphere, engaging in terrorist activities, drug trafficking, and money laundering. In 1994, Iran and Hezbollah bombed a Jewish community center in Argentina, killing 85 civilians and injuring more than 300. The Treasury Department has sanctioned numerous Hezbollah-linked operatives and entities in the Western Hemisphere for links to transnational organized crime. So, Admiral Fowler, in your written testimony, you stated that Hezbollah's external operations arm is responsible for at least three high-profile attacks in the region and three other planned operations that were disrupted. Can you elaborate on the threat that Hezbollah poses to U.S. interests in the Western Hemisphere? And if its presence is growing, where do you see it growing? Senator, these threats go right back to Iran, uh, the single largest state sponsor of terror in the world and the long arm of Iranian malfeasance is felt globally and in this hemisphere. Significant Lebanese diaspora, uh, they receive, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah receives funding support, and uh, they're intertwined with Iranian state-sponsored terrorists in ways that uh, undermine global security and security in this hemisphere. We have seen an increase in presence of uh, Iran activities in Venezuela uh, to support the illegitimate Maduro regime, uh, increasing the readiness of some of their uh, defense systems. And we have, uh, we have seen... Um, the continued involvement with uh, the diaspora and uh, economic fundraising, particularly down in the tri-border region, uh, neighboring Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil. Well, you know, you're speaking of the diaspora, that is extremely important. So how can we improve information sharing with our regional partners to identify and disrupt Hezbollah's activity in Latin America? One of the very positive um, things that I've seen over the last couple of years is the extent to which we have increased our information sharing with key partners, uh, Brazil, Colombia. We rely on them. Uh, they're like-minded democracies to share information so that we understand the threat. Uh, we have expanded that information sharing significantly this year. It is key uh, to moving forward, and it's built on longstanding trust that we have that's born out of uh, professional military education. We have security cooperation programs that work to build professional intelligence services. We do this through our 333 program, and uh, sustaining those programs are very important. During the past year, we've been able to expand modestly those programs in cybersecurity, and that will really be critical to understanding both the threat that's posed by Iran and their, their, their state sponsoring or terrorist organizations and other nation state actors like China. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move on and, and ask General Van Herk a little bit about our COVID response and support. Uh, you've been so terrific. You've deployed Navy hospital ships uh, at the start of the pandemic. You've cared for coronavirus patients at Army field hospitals. And now, of course, President Biden is directing states to open up vaccination appointments to all American adults by May 1st. Um, so I'm curious what your role may be in this new mission. So how is NORTHCOM generating and deploying forces to support the vaccine distribution and administrative uh, mission? And specifically, as members of the military and their families get vaccinated, and once military installations are covered, do you have coordinated plans or preliminary, or have you had preliminary conversations with local civil authorities uh, to leverage the capacity you have on the bases uh, for the local communities to get the vaccines deployed? 
Senator, we work with not only local communities, uh, state authorities, and our, our local bases to ensure that we follow the DOD's published uh, guidelines and along with uh, the CDC uh, as well. And so I'm confident going forward that uh, we'll continue to provide that support. We've uh, worked with the department. I put in a request for 100 teams, uh, 50 type one teams, uh, the most capable, capable of delivering about 6,000 shots per day. Uh, and also uh, 50 type two teams. As far as sourcing those, uh, the joint staff works with the services and the departments to calculate and uh, come up with sourcing solutions. The secretary approves those and allocates them to me. Uh, and we work through FEMA for the, uh, the actual location and mission assignment on how we're gonna uh, continue executing President Biden's mission to get uh, where he needs to be on one uh, July. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Scott, please. Thank you, Chairman Reed. Uh, Admiral Follow, thank you for the conversation last week. Uh, as we all know, uh, the fundamental problem in our hemisphere is Cuba. Uh, they, uh, they're the root of all the instability in Latin America. They terrorize their own citizens, they steal from their own citizens, and they support uh, dictators uh, in Latin America, such as Maduro uh, in Venezuela and, and uh, Ortega in, in Nicaragua. How important is it uh, for in your role for the Cuban regime to not have resources, to do everything we can as a country to make sure that the Castro regime doesn't have the resources they, uh, to terrorize their own citizens and uh, in, be involved in these other countries? In addition to the, the nefarious activity you cite, Senator, uh, Cuba and, and Russia and China are actively engaged just miles from uh, our home state. And uh, it's concerning as we see that relationship going forward. So uh, the extent to which uh, we can uh, prevent those kind of relationships from developing and from Cuba enhancing its capabilities, it's very important. And one of our assets, one of our real strategic toeholds in that effort is our naval station at, at uh, Guantanamo Bay. Do, uh, is it important that they don't have resources? I think it's uh, extremely important that the, uh, we prevent the, the uh, Cubans and their communists from doing what they're doing in, in Venezuela, where they're keeping Maduro in power and where they're uh, undermining, we see them actively undermining uh, free and fair elections and democracies across the hemisphere. So yes, Senator. What's their involvement in, in uh, Venezuela now? And are they, are they part of provoking Venezuela's aggression against uh, Guyana? Cuba's, uh, Praetorian Guard keeps Maduro in power. They're there in the thousands. Uh, they've, they own the intelligence service uh, alongside uh, Russia primarily and Iran and, and China to a lesser extent. They're uh, supporting and maintaining Maduro's uh, uh, defense systems and security forces. And um, the, uh, undoubtedly, that then gives Maduro, the capacity and capability to uh, rattle the saber and threaten the neighbors, uh, and also, frankly, allows a safe haven for narco traffickers and narco terrorists, which is what Venezuela has become. It's, uh, it's uh, hell for its citizens and it's heaven for the terrorists. So what can your command do to confront the uh, reports of illegal shipping, shipping activity uh, out of uh, Venezuela? We're actively involved with all of our interagency partners to track that, learn as much as we can about it, and then provide that information to our diplomats who can call it out and come up with uh, solutions that support the whole government uh, efforts to shift uh, Venezuela to democracy. Have you or our government, government through sanctions been able to do much to stop the flow of oil from Venezuela to Cuba? The, uh, the pressure has worked. The Maduro regime has been denied resources, but in any of these things, they're very clever uh, when you have no regard for rule of law and, and corruption fuels everything you do and you're supported by nation state actors like, like Russia and China, you can circumvent rules and laws and, and they've been able to they keep the flow up just enough to, to maintain their economy, particularly the regime's grip on that economy and its people on life support. Can you talk a little bit about the um, humanitarian crisis both in Cuba and Venezuela as a result of the Castro and Maduro regimes? Well, the human, uh, United Nations Human Rights Report lays it out, the atrocities that the regime has uh, 
committed on the people are, um, are beyond compare in this hemisphere and have created the largest migrant crisis this hemisphere has ever seen, some five million migrants that have swelled the, the services and uh, of all the social services. It's why we deployed hospital ship comfort twice in a year's period uh, prior to the pandemic. It's a credit to Colombia and Brazil and other democracies that they've been able to handle it as effectively, I, I commend them. And, uh, and in, similarly, in, in Cuba, it's, uh, you know, and it's, uh, we've had past migrant crisis and we have a mission set to prepare with Homeland Security for that. We've seen a, a, a slight uptick this year in migrants uh, uh, coming out of Cuba. We're watching it very closely and undoubtedly, again, it's due to the uh, brutal economic conditions and the, and the repression in, that we see and, and we study that um, intensely in our intelligence and information sharing efforts. Thank you, Admiral Fowler. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Scott. And uh, let me recognize Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Fowler, uh, you and I had an extended discussion last week uh, about activity in the region, as well as some of the push factors contributing to migration flows uh, that are exacerbating the uh, challenging situation at the southern border. I'd like to focus on the strength of criminal organizations in the region. A recent report by the Center for Strategic and International Studies found that the countries of the Northern Triangle lose more than 3% of their GDP to organized crime each year. These TCOs also contribute to outside, outsized homicide rates and undermine governance and security in the region. The bottom line is, they're in some ways better resourced than state actors and have proven capable of trafficking guns, money, drugs, and people. It's a major problem. Given these dynamics, do you feel you have the authority necessary to conduct operations that will effectively disrupt their activity in the long term? They, uh, as you mentioned, Senator, they control territory. They're well funded. They have a, a, a strength of in close to 200,000 when you look across the region, which is on par with all the police and military forces in total. Uh, so a powerful enemy to host nations, democracies, and a direct impact on our homeland defense here in the United States. The uh, our role is appropriately in support, detection, and monitoring, which means we, we find out as much as we can, and where we have authorities, we pass that off to law enforcement to interdict. And then we work at building our host nation partners' capacity. We are short in intelligence assets. We have less than 1% of those assets. We need additional capacity to build our partners uh, so that they can take care of this problem themselves. And we have received uh, about the right amount of presence, but it's important we stay on the field. An example of that is our Joint Task Force Bravo, which is a small team of about 700 soldiers and airmen and Marines. It's Sotocano, Honduras, that can support law enforcement with lift, with some intelligence, but more importantly, can rapidly respond. We saw that this past fall, two back-to-back -back hurricanes, major hurricanes, and we saved hundreds of lives rapidly. And what that does builds trust and actually helps us build the case for these partnerships and sustainable security long term. Earlier you stressed, and you did again, that the 1% uh, the of ISR funding goes to Southcom. Is that correct? It's 1% of the overall of the overall assets and capability center. So, but beyond that, if you were to um, wanted to ramp up the effectiveness of disrupting their activity, what other resources would you need? Sir, we've got to we've got to come up with a more effective whole government effort in the United States and really get at it mapping these networks. We're doing that, uh, but it's it's nascent. It needs more effort and finding the center of gravity. What's key to each organization? and then going at disrupting, and defeating or deterring that. And most of that is a law enforcement or a judicial or a partner nation effort with Southcom in support. So we play a critical role, but it's gotta be more holistically designed here in the US. We can't interdict our way out of this. Well, thank you, thank you, Admiral. Uh, 
General uh, Van Herc, um, you mentioned in your testimony that the uh, Pathfinder program as a complement to the work done by the Defense Innovation Unit. Um, also, the importance to being able to rapidly field capabilities uh, of the future. As chair of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, this is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, are you looking into uh, technologies like artificial intelligence to assist in processing the increasingly large volumes of data that come from our sensor systems? Senator, absolutely. As a matter of fact, Pathfinder does exactly that, uses machine learning uh, and additional capabilities. We must go down that path to operate uh, in a timely and efficient, effective manner. Any sense if our adversaries are doing the same thing, using uh, these technologies? Absolutely, Senator, especially China. Uh, they're they're uh, actively uh, moving forward with artificial intelligence. And then finally, are there any research gaps that you see that you think we should be investing more in? Uh, not specific to, to research. I, I would say uh, we must go to space sooner uh, and space-based capabilities that give us persistent domain awareness. Uh, that's where I would be focusing my efforts right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Let me recognize Senator Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. General Van Herc, let me start with you, uh, and let me thank you on behalf of all Missourians. It's great to see a fellow Missourian here as before, and uh, we're very proud of you and your service, so thank you for being here. Uh, let's uh, come back to this question of the border. Customs and Border Patrol issued a, a new batch of operational statistics last week that showed that CBP encountered more than 100,000 persons attempting entry across the southern border in February. That's a, about a 200% increase over this time last year. They also show that the number of unaccompanied minors attempting to cross our border, it's children, has doubled since January. And the number of family units has more than doubled from January to February. Give us a sense of how the surge of migrants is helping or hindering the cartel's operations along the border. Senator, I'm not aware of uh, necessarily how it hinders or helps. I think it's a symptom of the transnational criminal organization problem that we actually see. Uh, as Admiral Fowler pointed out, uh, you know, hurricanes, uh, transnational criminal organizations, um, they, you know, all the murders contribute directly to uh, the, uh, what we're seeing on the border, which includes uh, the migration that you're alluding to. I think it's this today that the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security said that we're on pace now for a 20-year high in border encounters, a 20-year record, which is pretty astounding considering uh, some of the uh, previous surges we've seen, for instance, in 2014. Uh, is it fair to say that we've got a crisis now at the southern border, General? Senator, I'll uh, stay out of the politics of whether it's a crisis or not. Uh, it's ac absolutely a homeland defense issue that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned because it creates opportunities, it creates vulnerabilities, and we have to be postured for each of those. The vulnerabilities that it creates for us is uh, instability. It, it creates instability in governance. It creates instabilities in the, the rule of law, if you will, in neighboring countries. Those will be exploited by countries such as China, Russia, Iran. So for me, it's a, a homeland defense and a national security imperative to take a look at that. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's also a humanitarian crisis. And I'm, for one, I'm not afraid of the word crisis. I can't understand why this administration is afraid of the word crisis. And given the, given the unbelievable humanitarian issues we're seeing at the border and the record surge that we're on pace for, I think this administration's inability to admit that their own policies are causing this crisis and the effect it is having in terms of emboldening the cartels, as you're saying. We know that no, nobody crosses that southern border without the permission and indeed without the profit of the cartels. Nobody. It's a wholly run criminal enterprise on the southern end of the border. And this administration's inability to grapple with that and do something about it, I think, is frankly astounding. And we're seeing it just day on day on day grow worse and worse. Let me ask you this, General. We've sent billions of dollars in security in, in money, in security assistance to the Mexican government over the past 14 years. Yet we are seeing, as you just alluded to, escalating violence, uh, even more drugs headed northward. Uh, those drugs make their way into every state of the union, including, including our home state, my home state of Missouri. In your assessment, why has our security 
assistance to Mexico fallen so short of its security objectives? I mean, why have not we been able to, to achieve more considering the prodigious sums that we've invested? Uh, first, I would talk to uh, Homeland Security about the problem. It's a, a law enforcement issue, much of it coming across the border. But I would tell you that the Mexican military, we have an incredibly close partnership and they're doing incredible things down there. With that being said, I think as Admiral Fowler alluded to, we need a whole of government strategy. You know, the arms that are arming these uh, transnational criminal organizations come right here from the United States of, the, of America and they flow south. In addition to that, the money that they're creating is being generated by precursors coming from Asia, from Asia, uh, China businesses and in, in uh, uh, industry, if you will, that flows in there. So we have to take a broader approach to get after this, which includes a whole of government effort and prioritizing and putting resources to the problem. Speaking of China, Admiral, let me come to you in just a, a little bit of time I've, I've got remaining. You wrote in your testimony that China is seeking to establish global logistics and basing infrastructure in our hemisphere in order to project and sustain military power. What kind of presence uh, do the Chinese forces maintain in the Western Hemisphere today that we ought to be concerned about? It, have to ask ourselves the question, why is China trying to achieve deep water ports in Dominican Republic, Jamaica, El Salvador, Panama, Panama Canal is key strategic ground, Argentina. They're setting, they're, they're using economic influence and access to set the conditions for the blue water Navy that they've built. Very good. I think we're going to have a closed session, aren't we, Mr. Chairman? So uh, uh, We're planning that, yes. Okay. I'll have a few more questions for you then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Howley. Now let me recognize Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here today and what you've done for our homeland and our, our hemisphere. Uh, General, it's been 20 years since we've had an attack on our homeland. Thank you for that. And, Everybody at Northcom, hard work that you've done. You know, I'm, I very much agree with you what what you said about outpacing our competitors. I'm proud to say that in Alabama, we're working to leap ahead in the areas of hypersonics, working very hard on that. And uh, right now, the world's largest and fastest hypersonic wind tunnel is under construction in Huntsville, and uh, I know they're working at a fast pace. Uh, Admiral enjoyed a conversation last week and enjoyed your straight talk. Um, Hope the American people will uh, start getting a sense of urgency. Uh, you have your hands full in Southcom, no doubt about it. Between transnational criminal organizations, Russia and China, you're a busy man. Uh, I do believe for a, a moment that the PRC's plan in our hem hemisphere are benign, and I hope that it will not take ch a Chinese aircraft carrier sailing between Florida and the Bahamas. Uh, for Americans to wake up to the fact that the CCP wished to nominate the world stage. I uh, hope it doesn't take something like that. You know, the work that both of you have done for Southcom and Northcom does for our nation is incredible, important to maintaining our strategic military objectives. Many of the items for both of you in the areas of responsibility strongly impact my home state in Alabama. Admiral, following the 2018 National defense strategy is something I personally believe in a good way to position our forces to thinking towards the future. Can you explain how Southcom is important to this strategy and specifically, how would you describe China's strategic objectives in a five or 10 year timeline? Well, I think that China <clears throat> as, uh, seeks economic dominance globally and their strategic objective is to be the dominant global power uh, unquestionably, and they'll do that in whatever way possible to ensure they have the preeminence of the, the Communist uh, Party. Uh, in this hemisphere, it's across all fronts. It's not just economics. Uh, typically, we think about that, uh, and we have this fallacy that's just economics. It's in the military realm, uh, they've recognized that partners in this hemisphere can't afford a lot of equipment, so they've upped the game in gifts. and. Um, and when they do offer military equipment, it's uh, often through corrupt deals that we can't compete with. They've replicated our professional military education. They have ubiquitous IT solutions. They have created uh, engineering and cyber scholarships for military personnel that goes beyond the kind of education and training that we offer in our IMET programs. They have expanded their defense attache presence. They have, uh, at least turned a blind eye to a range of illegal activity, unregulated fishing, unreported fishing, 
um, illegal mining and logging. And all this is done in an environment fueled by corruption uh, with no regard uh, or little regard for human rights and trying to write their version of the rules of the game. Uh, we've got to stay on the field to compete. We do that well. No one is better than the United States military, Department of Defense, uh, but we've got to work hard and tirelessly with the sense of urgency that you mentioned to stay number one in the game and to be the best. Thank you. General, uh, in regards to our southern border security, we, we hear all the negatives. What do you think has improved the most in the last four years? And, and then what worries you most looking forward at the southern border? Um, I think the coordination between the department and the interagency with regards to uh, since 2018 has, uh, has been probably the biggest improvement. Uh, with regards to what worries me most is about having domain awareness and the opportunities and vulnerabilities uh, that I already talked about in our own Western Hemisphere for uh, state actors such as China, Russia, or Iran uh, in our own neighborhood uh, due to instability, uh, due to ungoverned areas and uh, spaces. So I'm significantly concerned about uh, what's going on right here in our own hemisphere and neighborhood. Do you think we need a wall? I'll stay out of the, uh, the, the politics of a wall. Border security- well, Not politics, you think we need one. <laughs> well, border security is national security. We, we need to ensure that we have uh, policies in place, laws are enforced to ensure that homeland defense does not become a, a more strategic issue from the, uh, the borders. Yeah, one thing I noticed coaching for 40 years and being in education is the, just the influx of drugs. You know, just take away everybody coming across the border, it's just the influx of drugs are killing our kids. We're losing 60,000 a year to overdose. I mean, that, that right there should be a, just an alarm that we've got to have something different. Yeah, Senator, I, I agree with you. I, actually, I believe the number this past year was approximately 80,000. That's, that's unsatisfactory, and we have to get after that. And that's a symptom of that broader problem that I talked about, transnational criminal organizations that we can apply priority and resources to to get after it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tuberville. Uh, now let me recognize Senator Blackburn via WebEx. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we so appreciate having the hearing today and getting uh, the update. And Admiral Fowler, thank you for the time that you spent with me on the phone last week. Um, General Van Erk, I, I want to go back to your statement on Pathfinder the prototype Pathfinder data analytics project. Um, this is the kind of project that I think attacks two primary concerns with DOD data streams. One is the stove piping and the other is the need for modernization. And many times I sound like a broken record, if you will, by uh, talking about of what has happened with DOD through the years as things have become so stovepiped and the need for this modernization because information is power. We all know that, but you have to be able to analyze, to share, and to make actionable that data. So my question for you is, how could the Pentagon better um, utilize some of these emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence, such as the data that we're getting via ISR, um, and the AI that is used by Pathfinder to really make that information accessible, shareable across platforms and divisions and actionable when you're looking at how you implement plans for the future, how you change plans uh, based on the information that you are getting. Senator, first I would tell you I'm encouraged by uh, the joint warfighting concept, which also has a, a supplement uh, for information advantage that, that will help us move down this. Uh, as far as utilizing the data, I agree it's a strategic uh, uh, 
asset, if you will, data, uh, we can utilize it to not only uh, dominate in conflict, uh, but to create deterrence day to day. So for example, as an operational commander, uh, this data that's available to me, if I utilize it uh, with applying artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, and then disseminate it to key decision makers, I'm able to position forces ahead of a uh, competitor or adversary's actions, which creates deterrence. It's that deterrence by denial. But we must go faster in the department. And uh, 30 years ago, uh, the department led the way with innovations. Uh, today, I think that paradigm has flip-flopped to where uh, much of industry and uh, Silicon Valley is leading uh, the way forward, especially with regard to data. And so we need to take a look at our acquisition processes, our modernization processes, and uh, potentially flip the paradigm to stay competitive. Do you feel like that um, the Pentagon itself is flexible and agile enough to make these changes, utilize this data, make a change in a game plan immediately, and apply what they're learning from that intel? Uh, I believe that uh, the Pentagon uh, has proven over history to be incredibly uh, successful in adapting to when we need to. It hasn't always been as fast, and that's one of the reasons I talk about it. We have to have some culture change. I would also tell you this may require some looks at uh, policy. It may even require some looks at uh, law uh, to utilize data uh, differently as we go forward. What we don't want to do is create capabilities that we can utilize, and the policy that we have and the laws that we have don't allow us to be successful with the data and the information that's available. Thank you for that. I may come back to you for some, some specifics. Uh, Admiral Fowler, I, we've talked a lot about China this morning and uh, the transnational organizations. But as you look at dealing with China, whether it is through fentanyl and drugs or Belt and Road or great power competition, what do you not have access to in Southcom that you need? Well, as we've discussed, China is a global threat and we've got to address them holist that, that challenge holistically across the US government. In the Southcom AOR, we've got to be we have to be appropriately postured. So we need the right footprint of forces working with our embassies and our interagency team to stay engaged with our partner. Uh, so additional locations uh, for presence, not permanent, but access is really critical moving forward. Well, so, so it's the teamwork concept to with our allies, correct? Correct, Senator. Okay. Thank you all for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator, very much. Uh, and gentlemen, thank you for your testimony and your service to the nation. Uh, let me remind my colleagues that uh, upon adjourn, we will immediately move to SVC 217 for a classified briefing by Admiral Fowler about increasing Chinese influence in the Southcom area. Uh, there also is a vote scheduled for noon, uh, so we will try. To, we will accomplish both. I'll see you shortly over there, Admiral Fowler and General. Thank you for your distinguished service at Northcom. Uh, no, no further business before the committee. I'll adjourn.